All right, let's try this again. So, two to four decoders, in general, n to two raised to n decoders, where n is the number of bits for the input. So it could be three to eight, four to 16 decoder, and so on. And the, the simple block diagram for a two to four decoder is shown on the left here, where you have two active high inputs, two active high inputs, and I know they are active high because I do not see any bubble on the input side, which is indicative of active low inputs. We also have an active high enable. This is the active high enable. So that means that it is enabled when we connect this pin to a high voltage, a high, plus five volts, for example. Uh, and then we have four active high outputs. Four active high outputs. And in this case, we can, um, or in any case for decoders, or for that matter, any combinational logic, once we have a truth table for that particular design, we can go ahead and figure out all the, uh, you know, design elements. But what is critical is the first step, which is, you know, getting the truth table ready. Uh, in other words, what is the explicit relationship between the outputs and the inputs for that particular combinational component? So we have laid out a two to four decoder uh, truth table over here. And as you can see, there are two inputs here. There are, there are four outputs over here. They are all active high inputs and outputs. We also have an enable input, which is not part of the, the number of inputs because enable is just being used to enable the decoder versus disable the decoder. Right? Is it going to function like a decoder or is it not going to function like a decoder? So if enable pin is zero, the first entry in the in the truth table here, no matter what I1 and I0 are, XX, I don't care, no matter what they are, the outputs are all going to be zero, inactive, right? So let me highlight all the inactive things by say pink. Then in the next entry, in the next four entries, I have enabled my two to four decoder. And so in all those four instances, my decoder should operate, uh, should be enabled, which means that it should be able to decode my input. So when I give it zero, zero, I decode that as simply a zero, 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 one. So when Y0 becomes active, that is how I know that the input code is 00. zero. Followed by when it is zero 01, Y1 one is active. Then 10, Y2 is active. Y3 is active when it is 11. One one. So, you know, in other words, you can almost look at this as a binary to decimal decoding operation, right? Because zero, zero in binary is zero in decimal, one in decimal, two in decimal, three in decimal. Now all those uh, four instances are, as you can see here, Y zero is active, Y one is active, Y two is active, Y three is active. So it's almost like a binary to decimal decoding operation that is going on here. So that's your N raise, uh, N two, two to N decoding operation with active high inputs, outputs and enable. So we started talking about this, then we looked at, okay, let's take those, um, uh, the relate. so from the truth table, we started forming uh, equations for the, the, the outputs. So we said, all right, Y0 based on the truth table should be enable and uh, let's see, I0 or I1 complement and I0 complement. 
and we are, we wrote such equations in the last uh, class before the break just based on this. So y0 is 1 when enable is 1, I z, i1 is 0 and i0 is 0. So that's enable and i1 complement and i0 complement which can also be written as enable and min term 0, small m subscript 0. Or we also wrote it, I believe if I go back here, I can take a look at this. We also wrote y0 uh, what was that? Right, min term 0 and then we complemented it. So y0 can also be written as enable and max term 0 complemented. So I can write this in terms of min term 0 or max term 0. Notice over here the outputs are active high in this case. Similarly, I can write this as enable and max term 1 complement, enable and max term 2 complement, enable and max term 3 complement. Now when I talk about min terms and max terms, it is critical that I define which input is the most significant and which input is the least significant because otherwise max terms and min terms, I cannot be referring to them as uh, each row, min term 1, min term 2, what, what, what does that 1 and 2 correspond to? There's no way to know. So it is critical that right now I define which one is the least significant input and which one is the most significant input. For that, we have the numbering. As you can see, there is a i sub 0, i sub 1. So the numbers over here for each input indicate significance. So i0 is the least significant input and i1 is the most significant input. That is being indicated by the numbers that are being used for the inputs. We also have an active high enable over here. Now let us just quickly check whether uh, this guy is true or not whether we have actually drawn the logic diagram based on our uh, logic expression. So enable and, so as you can see, enable goes to each and every AND gate. Then for y sub 0, I need i1 complement and i0 complement. i0 complement comes from here, i1 complement comes from here. So I can say, okay, uh, y0 checks out. And similarly, if you go keep going down this list, you will see that y0, y1, y2, y3 will all uh, be in agreement. So the logic diagram over here will be in agreement with the logic expressions. Now, we are going to switch things to NAND gates. And the reason why we are switching things to NAND gates are many. One of them being NAND gates are faster. They require less number of transistors to implement. And requires more transistors. So when we are talking about digital circuits, when we are trying to learn how to sketch CMOS based logic gates, we learned that NAND and NOR actually require less transistors they are also universal gates, which means that I can synthesize any logic function using NAND only gates. So they are universal, they are faster, they are, they, they are going to occupy less uh, surface, they, less, re, uh, less real estate on any chip. So I'm going to go with NAND gates. So I, I can apply that logic to convert all of these guys to NAND. So what do I need to do for uh, the AND gates, well, I can say, let me do that in red. I can put a bubble in the front here and that becomes NAND gates. And because I put one bubble, I cannot, I, I, I have changed the logic. And once I change the logic, I also need to make these guys, all of those guys, Y0 underscore L, which means now, 
my outputs will need to be active look because I've put that bubble in front of the AND gate. That's exactly what you see happening right here. So let me draw that right there. So it's the same sketch, but it's been uh, tweaked a little bit so that we have NAND gates. So we have got those four NAND gates instead of four AND gates because we added the bubble in front. And then we have just changed the names from Y0 to Y0 underscore L and so on. So now our outputs are all, all outputs are active low. So when it is a zero, that's when you know that particular output is active. We have also made the enable active look. So that is simply just taking this enable pin and making that into an active low enable. So putting a bubble in, in the in the front there. Okay, what else? Now, we needed at some places we needed um, I1, in some places we needed I0, uh, in some places we needed I0 complement, in some places we needed I1 complement. Now, all those I1 and uh, I0 are now being written as A and B. Those are my two inputs instead of I0 and I1. So, the first question we can try to answer is, well, which one is the least significant uh, input and which one is the most significant input? In other words, which one is acting like I0 and which one is acting like I1? So let's see. Um, let, let's check that with a simple case. Let's say our input is 1, 0. So let us try to see which uh, output, and by the way, only one output can be active at any given time. That is the responsibility of the decoder chip. That's the responsibility of the designer. So let's see if our input is one zero, what happens? If that is guy is one, this is zero, this is one. If that is zero, that means I've got a zero there and I've got a zero there. If this is a one, that will trace as this is a one there, this is a one there. Uh, this is was a zero, so that becomes a one, that becomes a zero. This is a zero, this is a zero, this is a one, and this is a one, yes. So I have, I have um, traced all the inputs over here, and I'm going to attempt to write the outputs. What are going to be my outputs? Now, uh, for the first NAND gate, it is going to be, uh, oh, I'm gonna assume that it is enabled. How do I enable this chip? There is a question for you guys. How do I enable this decoder? Active low, yes. So I need to connect this pin to zero. I need to make this low, give it to ground. Yes, absolutely. G underscore L should be connected to ground or active low, zero. So if that, if that is the case, this will be a one here. So I'm going to move this over here. So for the first NAND gate, what do I have? Zero, uh, one, one. Well, if, if all the things are zero, only then the output will be one. Otherwise the output is going to be zero. Uh, no. If all the inputs, so I need say zero uh, and one and one, that, right? So that will be zero complement, which is one. So I get a one there. I get a zero there. I get a one there and a one there, right? So even if I have one of the inputs to be zero, then the output will be one. So which input has become active, which output has become active here? It is Y1 underscore L, which has become active here. All the others are inactive. So 
So based on that, which input do you think is least significant? A or B? Which one is least significant? A is right. Because when you read this as 0, 1, that is 1. But if you read it as 1, 0, that would be 2. So why 2 underscore L would have had to be active, which is not the case here, which is most significant input for here. So A is acting like I0 and B is acting like I1 in the previous diagram. All right. Let us also uh, answer one more very, very interesting question. Now notice the, the two uh, inverters over here. Why do we need those? For What I mean by that is, instead of using this and then taking these pins over there and there, why didn't we just use this from here? because that would have also been A. If you double complement, it is also A. If you don't comp uh, don't complement, it is also A. The device driving it might have a limited fan out. That is one uh, good reason. The device or the component that is before this decoder might have a limitation on the number of things I can connect to the output of that particular component. So if I'm uh, connecting one decoder, or two decoders or 10 decoders, my voltage levels for A and B could go down, could go down to, you know, maybe from high to the undefined region, which we don't want. So what do we do in the case of, you know, in such a case where the voltage levels might misbehave? Well, we use buffers, right? Buffers are used to restore the uh, the voltage levels for a logic low versus logic high. So that's exactly what we are doing over here. By using these two back-to-back -back not gates, we have essentially buffered, which is what over here, input buffering. We have buffered A. So even if the voltage at A goes down from a logic one to the undefined region, the buffering is going to restore that voltage level. Yes, so uh, Charles brings up a good point. There may be something like the discrepancy between the TTL logic levels and CMOS logic uh, levels, which is also, you know, something that this input buffering can adjust to, which is, you know, the, the, the core, the reason over there is as the logic levels are going away from their extreme values, we, we need buffering to restore those to solid zero and solid one, which is what input buffering is uh, giving us. Okay, so I think uh, this is it in this case. All inputs are active high, by the way. Inputs are active high here. I don't see A underscore L, active high inputs. And we have active low outputs and enable is octave also active low. All right, let's move on here. Um, there is a decoder symbol. There is a chip which is numbered 74X139. That particular chip has two 2 to 4 decoders. We are only showing half that chip over here. So we are only showing one of the 2 to 4 decoders which has the active low enable, the two active high inputs, and we have the four active low outputs. And as you can see here, that bubble and that active low, that bubble and active low, so if I remove the bubble, all four bubbles at the output, then they would be active high. 
outputs and I would need to call them appropriately y0, y1, y2, y3 as opposed to y0 underscore l and so on. We have bubble here, bubble here, bubble here, right? So for this particular 7400 series IC, 74139, we are only showing half of it. Any inputs are active high, enable is active low, and the four outputs are active low as well. This is the diagram for the complete 74139 chip. The X in the middle refers to the technology that was used to design that. So 74LS139, for example. So don't get thrown off by that X. X just refers to the, the technology that was used to design that IC. 74 and 139 are the numbers themselves indicate that it is a 2 to 4 decoder and there are two of them. I hope now you see why they were named as 1A, 1B and not simply A and B. They were named 1A and 1B and 1Y1 and 1Y0 and so on. All the, those ones were present to indicate that it is the first 2 to 4 decoder over here. And then if I go down, this is the second 2 to 4 decoder here, which also has its active low enable. So those are two to, two to four decoders. So I can literally draw a line in the middle here to separate those out, which is also a line over here to separate those out. So we have the, essentially we have uh, taken the previous diagram and then uh, made two copies of it, um, two independent copies of it. So this one is a 16 pin IC with pin number seven, uh, so 16 pin IC, but I, I think uh, the two that are missing need to be uh, power and ground. I'm not entirely sure which pins those are, but they, they are pins for uh, power and ground as well, which are not being shown for the 74139 chip here. All active, uh, all active low in outputs, um, active low enables, active high, inputs. Notice over here, these are two independent two to four decoders. There is no connection between one to the other. Now, in terms of symbols, there are some things that are allowed and some things that are not allowed. So for example, uh, the one that you see on the left is okay. Why is it okay for the half 74139 chip? They are okay because Still, if I look at this, the bar for the outputs and the bar for the enable indicates that those input, those enable and outputs are active low, which is what it is in reality for 74x139. But if you look at the diagram on the right here, which is not allowed for this chip, this is an incorrect diagram. What have we done over here? We did a complement here and then we did a double complement here, which means that now the outputs are being considered as active high, which they aren't for this particular chip, the outputs are active low. So that's why it is incorrect. Now we are gonna move on to uh, uh, the next higher level decoder, which is the three to eight decoder. Three inputs, where are they? One, two, three. These are going to be active high inputs. All inputs are active high. Why? Because I don't see A underscore L. I don't see B underscore L. I don't see C underscore L. I see A, B, C. So the naming convention tells me that it is an active high input case. How about the, the enables? How many enables? Active high or active low? So 
So I've got three enables here. One of them is active high. Two of them are active low. So G1, G, G1 is active high and G2 and G3 are active low. In total, there are three enables. Does the diagram look very similar? This is the exact, you know, the, the formation of this particular logic diagram is almost identical. It's just in size, it's bigger, but, but it is identical to this. Well, there are two, two copies. So if I go back here, it is this. Instead of four outputs, now I have eight outputs. Instead of three, in, uh, two inputs, I have three inputs. And instead of one enable, I have three enables. But the construction of this particular logic diagram is very closely related to this one. Now, let us try to see um, what happens under certain cases. So these cases, I am going to use maybe, uh, let's say I'll use blue to check something. Uh, what I'll do is I will have A as uh, a one, B as another one and C as a zero. I'm just going to assign some arbitrary inputs over here to see what happens. And I'm going to assume that it is enabled. So in order to enable this, I would need to connect this guy to one. I would need to connect this guy to zero. I would need to connect this guy to zero, which means over here, I would have a zero there, a zero there, a zero there, which means I would have a one there, one there, one there, which means it will be a one there, which means active. Zoom out. So it is enabled. Now, my inputs and arbitrary input cases, A, B, C, as one, one, zero respectively. Now let us see what happens. So because it is enabled, I don't need to worry about the enable now. They are all going to be one, which means, let's see, uh, one here, one here, one here, all the, the last inputs are going to be, uh, let's see, this one, yes. And I have this guy. Yes. Next, I have ABC. So if this guy is a zero, that is a one here, that's a zero there, that's a zero there, that's a one there, that's a zero there, that's a one there. Where am I going to have ones? Well, if you, if you go back and take a look at Y3 underscore L, you will see that this guy is one. The next guy is also one because it's connected to this. The next guy is also one because it is connected to this. And the next guy is also one because it is connected to this. So that's the only output which is going to be zero. And you can verify this. All these guys will be one. That is the only time it is zero. So I can make a few concluding remarks over here. One, all outputs are active low. Uh, active low. What else? I can also say A is the least significant input and C is the most significant input. Because if C would have been the least significant, I would have had to read it as 110, which is 6. Which means this guy would have been active, which is not the case. So I, Y3 is active now because I'm reading it as 011 
and in 0, 1, 1, C is most significant, A is least significant input. All right. So I guess uh, that's all I have for this uh, slide. Uh, however, I'm hoping that you guys are, yes, thank you. You guys are wondering why are they three enables? So please hold on to that thought because I'm going to answer that question in just a minute. The, the answer that I have is to have a little bit more control over when the decoder chip becomes active. It is critical while we cascade decoders. So if I'm connecting multiple decoders to build bigger decoders, that configuration becomes very, very useful. So hold on to that question. I'm going to answer that in just a minute. Um, now, we were talking about the 328 decoder. It is also available in a 7400 series IC, which is slightly uh, a different number, 74138. Earlier we saw two to four decoders, two of them in one chip. That was the 74139 chip. This is the 74138 chip. 328 three decoders um, enables one of them active high, two of them active low. Inputs all active high, outputs, all active low. Now, just to see how we are doing, I'm going to assign some arbitrary inputs here. Let us say I have one zero zero here. Oh, actually, and then I have one I've just given it some arbitrary inputs. I want you guys to tell me which pin, which pin of the IC will be low. Which pin number will be low? Okay, but pin number, yes, 14. So, Alex, you, you say Y1, but I was also hoping that you recognize on the, on the 74138 chip, these are corresponding to simply the pin numbers, pin outs of that chip. So, this guy in this case is going to be zero. Everything else will be uh, one, inactive. Wonderful, 14 is the right answer here. All right, let's keep moving. Oh, by the way, what if, let us do this second case in red. I have one zero one and I have one zero zero here. Which pin number will be uh, low? Same question. Which output pin number will be low? Second case is G1 is one, the pin number four and five are connected to ground and power. Same inputs, ABC are one zero zero. Which pin number is low? None, yes. None is the right answer. All pins will be one in this case. All will be inactive. Good. All right, let's move on here. So I hope with this, you see that it is relatively very simple and quick to 
um, know the output once you have figured out the inputs. Now let's come to this cascading, decoder cascading uh, exercise. What we are doing here is we are taking two, three to eight decoders. They are two separate chips with uh, references as U1 and U2. And we are making a four to 16 decoder in this case. So using two, three to eight decoders, can I make a 4 to 16 decoder. So where are the 4 inputs? Where are the 16 outputs? The 4 inputs are right here. N0, N1, N2, N3 and because of how I have numbered them, I know which one is the least significant input and which one is the most significant input. N3 is my most significant input and N0 is my least significant input. The combination of those four inputs, I'm calling them N. For example, 1101 or 1001, any, any four uh, bit combination. And there is an overall enable underscore L. So this is going to be our uh, main enable, like the overall enable here, overall enable input. So this is the one that controls the enable for the 4 to 16 decoding operation. But we know that 74138 chips, they have three enable inputs each. Some of them are active high, some of them are active low. So let's go, we are going to have to figure out how we relate them to the inputs. Where are the outputs now? 16 of them. I get uh, eight outputs from the, the top three to eight decoder and I get eight outputs from the bottom three to eight decoder the least significant output of the top chip is that pin number 15, 0 underscore L. And then the most significant output is going to be the most significant output of the bottom, most, bottom, bottom chip. DEC, decimal 0 underscore L all the way to 15 underscore L. So I've got those 16 outputs over there. Now let us see what happens. How are we doing this decoding operation? Now, to explain this a little bit better, what I'm going to do is I'm going to quickly make a truth table which will help with this. How many outputs have I got? I've got uh, four in inputs, N0, N1, N2, N3. So I'll lay, lay them over here, N3, N2, N1, N0. And then on the other side, I'm going to have say Y15 underscore L, Y14 underscore L, so on up to Y, uh, let's say two underscore L, Y1 underscore L, and then Y0 underscore L. So what is going to happen if I have, so notice what happens here, 0, 1, 0, 1, and then you go down. N0 will keep alternating because that's how the least significant input behaves. So for that case, when N, I'm going to assume that everything is enabled, it is enabled. If it is enabled, Give me one second, Alan. So if it is enabled, N0 is 0, N1 is 0, N2 is 0, N3 is 0. It will decode this as 0 here, everything else will be a 1. Everything else will be inactive, Y0 underscore L will be active. 
But notice what happens at the at the middle stage. If I if I divide this up as zero zero eight zeros here and then eight ones here. I have eight zeros over here and eight ones over here. How is that zero going to move? That zero is going to move from there to there will be a stage where you get y7 underscore l. So that zero will keep moving here and will go to this, which will be for y7 underscore l. And for the next guys, it will start with eight and then it will go down to 15. Which tells me that when I'm in the top half, n3 is zero, I'm in the, I am essentially operating the top 74x138 chip. Those are my outputs. Then at the uh, when n3 is 1, I have the bottom 74x138 chip that is being used that needs to be enabled. You guys see this? That that's essentially how this is supposed to work. So now let's take this information, go back one bit and see if this is how this is working or not. So, let us go step by step. G1. Enabled. A, B, C are connected to N0, N1, N2. That's how they are being decoded. G2 underscore B. Enabled, it is uh, connected to ground, hard connection to ground. So enabled, check. How about the others? Now let us see. Enable of the overall pin goes to G2A over here and it goes to G2B over here. So now let us see, Oh, how about G2A? G2A is connected to N3 and this is also connected to G1. Now, I hope you see that, uh, well, first let's take a look at the overall input. If the overall input enable underscore L was zero, that means those guys would have been enabled. G2B and G2A would have been enabled if the overall enable input is active. Next, if N3 is 0, then G2A is 0, which means this chip is active now. But if N3 is 1, which refers to the bottom half of this table, N3 is 1 there. This guy is going to be 1, which means this will be disabled, but this guy will be enabled. You guys see that? Because this is going to be 1 in that case. Otherwise, it would have been 0 earlier it was 0 now it became 1 so as i change n3 the same three inputs n2 n1 and 0 will be decoded in the top 8 and the bottom 8 outputs alan i hope that uh, that answered your question so Alan's question is for the 3 to 8 decoder, what does G2A correspond to? G2A corresponds to an active low 
input uh, sorry active low enable input it enables the first decoder well it enable so it, it is these are connected together right and those are connected together and they are actually tied to n3 so g2a for the first chip is actually hardwired to g1 an active high input and they are both tied to n3 so when n3 is 0 this guy will be enabled the top one and when n3 is 1 this guy will be enabled the bottom one so by having some inputs at active low and some inputs at active high that is how we are able to cascade decoders right that is the that is the uh, reason why we have more than one enables all right i hope that answered your question let us see let's take a take an example here um, an arbitrary input enable underscore l is 0 and n is 1011 which output is active which output pin is low y3 bottom okay y3 bottom is good but with the question is output pin so you would say pin number 12 on the bottom chip bottom pin 12 so if i can just highlight that it would be right here DEC 11 underscore L because 1011 is decimal 11. That is the only pin that will be low. Everything will be high. Yes, pin number 12 is the right one. Pin number 12 on the bottom chip is the right one. Because there is also a pin number 12 in the top chip which will not be active. It will, it will also be one here. All right, I hope uh, you guys find that helpful. Let's move on. So we talked about this uh, truth table for the four to 16 decoder. Now, decoders come in various forms. It doesn't have to be the two to two raised to n form every time. We also have a seven segment decoder as you see over here. Uh, this is also something that you guys have uh, worked on in your studios. I think it was the second studio where you designed a uh, seven segment uh, decoder. So you have an enable input here, an active low enable. This is the 74X49 chip. So there's also an IC. You have four active high inputs which are decoded based on a seven segment display as seven active high outputs so all are active high right all active high oh uh, enable is active low and we know that you know the seven segment display is segment a b c d e f g uh, that is uh, sketched up in a in a uh, eight pattern eight the, those seven se uh, uh, those leds are arranged in a pattern eight now let us check what happens if you 
say, have a arbitrary input sequence. Let's suppose I connect a zero there, enabled it, and I have a zero, one, zero, zero. Like those are my inputs. Now, if you go and look at the data sheet of 74X49, um, you will see that A is the least significant input and D is actually the, uh, no, 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 I wrote it reverse. A is the most significant input and D is the least significant input. So you have to read it as 0, 1, 0, 0 and not the other way around. So in this case, you know, you have A here, B, C, D, E, F and G. As you can see, for to, to display 4 in decimal, what do you have? G, B, C, G and F need to be active, right? So B is active, C is active, uh, F is active and G is active. Everything else is inactive. So those are my seven active high outputs for the uh, being decoded based on the seven segment decoder. And, you know, I hope that, you know, with this conversation, you also know how to make a truth table for this, right? So you have four inputs, you will have seven outputs. For each combination on the input, you will have the corresponding output. Now you will only go from zero to nine, all the other input scenarios, which are say greater than one zero uh, one zero, right? Greater than or equal to one zero one zero, your outputs will be don't care, right? You don't care about that. So that's how you can make a truth table. From truth table, you can find out the um, simplified logic expressions for the seven outputs and you can do the design. So you can try to figure out what goes inside this from that. From that. All right, let's move on here. <clears throat> so that's the seven segment decoder. Um, you know, you could also design something like this, right? Uh, you could design something like, I will give you a, a BCD code and you tell me the, um, the one to one out of 10 code, right? So you can, you can consider this decoder as a one code to a different code converter, like a code converter, right? One, I'll give you an input of two, four, two, one. The output should be one out of 10, right? So you, you can, you could, you could go from uh, gray code to uh, a, a decimal, uh, uh, gray code to, a seven segment decoder. So you could go in many different, uh, you know, decoding uh, combinations is what I'm trying to say. It doesn't have to be the conventional n to two n, two raised to n. Okay, let's move on here. Now, another very, very interesting uh, application of decoders is the fact that I can, exp I can, uh, synthesize, I can implement logic functions using um, decoders. So let us back up a little bit. Let us back up a bit and try to figure out how did we, how to synthesize logic functions. So, so far in the course, we have been synthesizing logic functions what were the what were some of the ways one was the simplest basic gates right using basic gates which was and or not so using these three logic gates you can synthesize any logic function what is the other one next one was NAND only. I can synthesize logic functions just by using NAND, just by using NOR. I'm also saying that I can do synthesis of logic functions. You tell me the logic function, I'll synthesize, this, uh, synthesize it with 
a decoder. And in fact, later on, we will add multiplexers to this. That's coming up too. But right now we are focusing on number four, which is the decoders. So in order to do this, let us see. Um, I want to do this in a slightly different manner. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so what do I have here? I have yeah okay. So I'm going to use this seven four x one three eight decoder and some basic logic gates to implement this particular function. The function is f is a and b and c or a and b complement and c complement or a complement and B and C complement. So, what would be, how can I write F? Well, I can write F as min term 7, right? A, B, C, that's min term 7. And min term what is that? Zero one, uh, sorry, one zero zero. Min term four and ABC zero one zero. Min term two. Right. I'm just writing the function as min term seven plus min term four plus min term two. In other words, I can write it is like this. Summation. A, B, C, uh, what do I have? Uh, I had, I think, uh, 2, 4, and 7, right? Sum of min terms. Now, if I complement this, what do I get? F complement on the left side, and I'm going to get a max term 7 here, a max term 4 here and a max term uh, 2 there because the complement of a min term is a max term. So I get max terms on the right side. And I know that using a decoder, I get max terms on the output. So max term 7 is actually Y7. So that's got right there. But max term 4, hold on, is it max term 4? Why, why is there a confusion between max term 4 and max term 1? The reason why there is a confusion there is because I have assumed incorrectly that A is the most significant here and C is the least significant here. I can't do that. The reason I can't do that is because if I look at 74138 chip A, B, C. I know that A is actually the least significant input, C is the most significant input. So I, I can't do that. I have to reverse it. So this is going to be max term 1 in this case, and max term 2 is fine. So literally, what I have to do is I have to take. Uh, y7, I need to take y1, and I need to take y2, and I need to put them through an AND gate. If I put them through an AND gate, I get F complement, but if I put a bubble in front, I get F. You guys uh, see the how I we have implemented. So we have connected A here, B here, C here. I have connected one here, zero here, zero here, and I have left all these connections unused. I have taken only pin number fourteen, pin number thirteen, and pin number seven. Connected that to a NAND function, NAND gate, three input NAND gate, and the output is F.
Now, quick question. What if I said, you know what, instead of this, I will connect this as CBA. I can do that. I can connect inputs to the chip in a reverse order. If I did that, then I would have to take what? I would have to take 2, 4 and 7 instead of, so in that case, I can use Y4. You guys see the difference between like how we go back and forth between Y4 and Y1 in this case? Because if you want to follow the same order as ABC for even your input connections, then you need to use Y1. If, if, you, if you can quickly reverse that input to CBA and then use Y4. Now let us uh, play with this a little bit more. Um, let us say I have a function. I'm going to just take some arbitrary function and see if I can uh, look at that. Oh, where do I have that one? Something that is not, well, let's see this. Uh, Let's suppose I have a summation A, B, C are my inputs and I say one, two, three. That's it. So my, my, um, this is sum of min terms, right? Which is essentially canonical sum of products. So if I have to implement F like this, what is that? What would I have to do? Well, I, have, I would have to take that chip. I would have all the three enables here. I would have A, B, C over here. I have, so enables, sure. I need to do the, that for the enables, one, zero, zero. And after that, I have all the outputs here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. All right. Just like I have over here. Let's call them Y0, Y1, Y2, Y3, Y4, Y5, Y6, and Y7. Right. So, in one case, F is min term 1 plus min term 2 plus min term 3 considering that A is the most significant input and C is the least significant input. So, if A is the most significant, then that needs to get connected here. B is B and C is there, right? Okay, that's one. That's the first step. Next, because I have synthesized the function as sum of min terms, I would need to take the max terms over here and convert to min terms. How do you convert max terms to min terms? Well, put, an, put a not gate in front of it. So, which ones would I need to convert? Well, 1, 2 and 3. Okay, 1 here, 2 here, 3 here. Now, I have converted the max terms to min terms. After I do that, I simply have to go through uh, what? This or this or this, right? So, a NOR gate. So that's F. Or if you if 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 from De Morgan's law we know that this is simply a NAND function. So that's exactly what we did in the previous diagram. We took those particular outputs and then we go, went through. Uh, a NAND gate to get my function f. My inputs, active high inputs. My enable signals, one of them is active high, two of them are active low. Active low here, active low here, active high here. How about the outputs? f. Is, this is, the, this is an important question here. Is f active high or active low?
Yes, active high is right. How can I quickly verify this? Well, I can quickly verify this by assuming that say for example, min term one, right? Min term one is, is a function there. What is min term one? If uh, min term one, so that needs to be a, b, c, one, zero, zero. That's min term one. For, if you have min term one, I get a zero there, which means I get a one there, which means I get a one there. So my output is active when I go in with min term one. So my output is active high. And you can apply that to min term two, min term three, you, you will see that the output is going to be one when you have those three, uh, that particular min term going in. Note that you could also synthesize F as this. What would that be? This would be zero, four, five, six, comma seven, right? What would you need to do? They are the same. I hope you see that this, come on, this and this are the same. One is synthesized as sum of product, the other one is the product of sum. So how would the thing look like with this? Let's do that on the other side. Let's add a page here. Uh, sure. And I'm going to copy certain things. And I will need this as well. My inputs, I can leave them as enabled. This function, if it is written in this particular form, this essentially means that I need to take max term zero, uh, max and it with max term four, and it with max term five, and it with max term six, and it with max term seven. So what is that? That is simply take zero here, four here, five here, seven here, and and them together to get F. Product of max terms. Now tell me in this case, is the output going to be active low or active high? active low in this case, yes. All right, um, let's, con so I can synthesize uh, any logic function with this. Um, we know that if I, you know, if I give you any logic function, so for example, if I say F equals A or B and C, we know how to convert that into a canonical sum of products. And we also know how to convert this to canonical products of sum. And once we do that, we can take that information uh, in the summation form or the pi form and synthesize it using the decoder. Now, in this case, I have three inputs, A, B, C. So that means I would need a three to eight decoder. If you had say F equals X or Y, which is only two inputs, you would only need a two to four decoder in that case. So the number of inputs to the function uh, dictate how many inputs you are going to have uh, for the decoder. All right, let's move on here. The other side of the coin, which is the encoder. So encoder is sort of the opposite of decoder. In this case, you are taking some input and converting it into an encoded output. You are 
encoding things as opposed to decoding things. So it's almost like an uh, opposite of uh, the decoder. So for the decoder, if you had n inputs, you had two raised to n outputs. For the encoder, it is going to be in general, two raised to n inputs and n outputs. For the decoder, we said only one output needs to be active, right? For the decoder, we said only one output can be active at any given time. And whose headache is this? Who's, whose responsibility is it? Well, the designer, right? The designer, not the user. The designer will take the responsibility here. Not the user. Now let's come back, let's come to the encoder side of things. For the encoder, only one input can be active. Whose responsibility is it going to be? User, absolutely. So the, it's the user's headache to make sure that only one input to the encoder is active. What if we go wrong? The users can obviously make mistakes and accidentally give more than one of the inputs active. What do we do then? Well, we need to establish priority. So if we go wrong, then we are going to prioritize one input over the other active input. So we, we would need to establish some sort of priority to take care or, or I can say to back up the user's mistakes to compensate for user mistakes. But it's the user's responsibility to make sure that only one input is active at any given time. So we will start with a basic encoder and then we will move to a priority encoder. In basic encoder, we are assuming that user makes no mistake. And in the priority encoder, we are covering for some user mistakes. Here, uh, before we actually go here, I, I want to take it slow. Talk about uh, 2 to 4, or in this case, 4 to 2, basic encoder. So let's do that. Uh, one is probably too much. All right. So here I'm going to talk about 4 to 2, basic encoder. I'm going to have four inputs. Uh, let's let me call them I input three, input two, input one, input zero. Four inputs. And I've got two outputs, y1 and y0. So the numbering is going to indicate most significant input is I3, most significant output is y1. So basic encoder, I'm making sure that uh, only one input is active at any given time. And, you know, for the sake of convenience, I'm also going to assume, assume enabled. It is, we, we have an enabled encoder that we are considering right now. So only one input can be active. Which one could it be? It could be this. It could be this, it could be this, it could be this, right? So if the first one is active, and in this case, I'm considering that all inputs and outputs are active high, this guy is zero, this guy is zero, this guy is zero. Then this guy is zero, this guy is zero, this guy is zero. Only one input is active at any given time. Next, if I have, if I'm encoding this, sort of the opposite of the decoder. If I0 is active, I will encode that as 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. 
all inputs and outputs are active high in this case. So I hope that you guys are uh, okay with the truth table. I have made sure that I only have those four cases where only one input is active at any given time. I'm putting a lot of responsibility on the user here with the basic encoder. And I've assumed to make keep things simple, I've assumed that it is an enabled encoder. So what do you do with any combinational logic design? You write expressions for the output in terms of the input. So what would be the expression for uh, say y0? y0 okay where is it where is y0 1 here here so y0 is 1 at those two locations which means y0 should equal i1 or i3 So if i3 is 1 or i1 is 1, y0 will be 1. Yes, Alex, you're right. How about the next one, y1? That should be simple. It is simply going to be i2 or i3, yes. Now, Looking at these two things, is there is uh, is there something that is bothering you guys when you look at these two um, these two statements? Yeah, but you know, so we are, we are only worried about the case where only one input is active, right? So it's, it's only focusing on the four cases here. So those four cases are being captured in the two expressions for y0 and y1. But I, 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 Okay, so let's see this. I1 present, I3 present, I2 present. Huh. It doesn't matter what I1 is. So for a, for a for a basic encoder, I0 is not playing a role in determining Y0 and Y1. The least significant input doesn't matter in this case. You guys see that? So that's one of the, uh, you know, unique things that uh, 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 an encoder has. And we will see this play out later as well. Um, now, let me talk about the corresponding priority encoder. So what I'll do is this, I will simply uh, make a duplicate of this. Can I make a duplicate of this? I'm sure, don't worry about it, we'll do that. I'm gonna take everything here. Copy it, after paste it, and then I'll start modifying certain things. So for example, I'm going to be talking about a priority encoder here. I'm going to assume that it is enabled. Um, I'm going to have, <clears throat> I'm going to have 
some sort of priority going on here so to so as to cover for some mistakes all inputs and outputs are still being considered as active high uh, so let me put that over here that is still the case and i'm going to erase this for now so the for the first case uh, in the, this one is priority encoder For the first case, if I0 is active, then I decode that as uh, Y0 is 0, Y1 is 0, 0, 0. In the next case, if Y1 is active, I am not going to take I0 into account, which means that if the user accidentally activates i0 i am going to ignore that and i'm going to decode that as y0 is 0 uh, y0 is 1 and y1 is 0 0 1 next if i2 is active the moment you see i2 is active you don't care about i1 don't care about i0 the moment you see i3 to be active don't care about I2, don't care about I1, don't care about I0. In other words, priority is given to the most significant active input so if i see y2 as uh, sorry i2 as one i don't care about the 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 least significant inputs here i will decode that as one zero which is decimal two corresponding to i2 so that's how we have we are going to implement priority in this uh, encoding operation so that now some of the pressure that the user has is alleviated, right? So now even if the user goes wrong, we are going to assume that it, it, the user at least goes right with the most active, most significant active input. Um, now in, uh, for, uh, in order to write logic expressions for Y0 and Y1, what we'll do is we'll try to write row expressions. So on this I'll have row expressions for each row I'm going to write an expression so for the first row what do you have i3 is 0 i2 is 0 i1 is 0 and i1 uh, i0 is 1 so that's what I'm going to call that i3 complement and i2 complement and i1 complement and i0 and I'm going to define that as H0. For the next one, what do I have? I have I3 complement, I3 is 0, I2 complement, I2 is 0, I1, I1 is 1, and I0 doesn't matter. So I'm not going to write that. And I'm going to define that as H1. Next. For the third row, I have uh, I3 complement, I2, that's it. I1 doesn't matter, I2, I0 doesn't matter. So I'm going to call that H2. And for the last one, I have what? Simply I3, H3. So what should I write for the expressions for y0 and y1? y0 is going to be uh, h1 or h3 and 
y1 is going to be h2 or h3. Here is h0, h1, h2, h3, h1, h2, h3, h2 and h3. Again, we have the same situation. H0 doesn't play a role. It is not connected to anything. All right. I hope uh, that that was a helpful exercise. Now, let us... So, once we have a good understanding of 4 to 2 basic encoder and 4 to 2 priority encoder, then we can go on to make a 8 input priority encoder, which is, which is what we are going to do uh, next. So here we have uh, the two raised to n inputs for a, for a bi binary encoder, two raised to n inputs. They are numbered as i0, i1, i2, and so on up to two, i2 raised to n minus 1. Like for example, we had i0, i1, or i0, i1, i2, and so on up to i7, and so on. Um, in our example, earlier example, we had i0, i1, i2, i3. The outputs are simply n outputs. And when we were doing this for the uh, 4 to 2 case, we got some expressions. And that's for, for the basic encoder. There's also a basic encoder here. This is a uh, 8 to 3 basic encoder. Those are my eight inputs. Those are my three outputs, y0, y1, y2. And because it is based off of a table, let us take a look at the basic encoder. What did we have here? y0 is i1 or i3. If the size of this increases, what, what happens? You will simply have i1 plus i3 plus i5 and i7. Over here for y1, what do you have? Here, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. So you will have i2 plus i3 and then you will have i6 plus i7. That's exactly what we have in this case. y0 which is that guy is i1 plus i3 plus i5 or i7. y1 active high all of them are active high y1 is 2, 3, 6, and 7. Earlier we had just 2 and 3. The next one will be what? If you had one more output here, column, what would that go like? 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1. 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. The next one will go 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, 1. Right? 4 zeros, 4 ones. Where are the ones? In places 4, 5, 6, and 7. Right here. 4, 5, 6, and 7. So that's y2 for 4, 5, 6, and 7. And these are simply OR operations. So you use OR gates to connect all of them together. OR, OR, OR to relate the inputs and the outputs. So all of that goes in here. So that's a 8 to 3 basic encoder going off of, even well, just uh, expanding on our uh, conversation of 4 to 2 basic encoder. Next. Now, a problem in real applications is, for example, if you wanted to encode a requester. So, for example, if you wanted to assign a number to uh, the person who requests for certain service, right? So, there are people coming in, many of them, N of them, right? 1, 2, 3, and so on to N. And you want to assign them a unique number as the output, you can use an encoder to do this. But just to be safe, you would have to use a priority encoder so that there is no confusion, right? You are giving priority to the most significant input, active high input, right? Uh, and priority can be given in other ways, but that's the most general priority form. I will give priority to the most significant active input. So, if requester 2 says, I need service, you will give them the number 2. 
if requester 3 comes in and says I need service you will give them the number 3 and so on so that's a, that's a that's a that's a real application of how you could use an encoder depending on which input becomes active at the output side you will have a number which is you know maybe 10 or maybe 11 and so on like a, a, a binary number Now coming to the 8 input priority encoder, I hope that you can uh, expand on our conversation on 4 to 2 priority encoder and look at this. For 4 to 2 priority encoder, we had H3, H2, H1 and H0 as our row expressions. And how did those go? If you, If I go back here. I can say H3 was I3, H2 was I3 complement I2 and so on. And if I look here, H7, I7, H6, I6 and I7 complement, H5, I5, I6 complement I7 and so on up to H0. And then you take those row expressions and then write expressions for A2, A1 and A0 which are the three active high outputs. For A0, you are going to have 1, 3, 5, 7. For A1, you are going to have 2, 3, 6, 7. For A2, you are going to have 4, 5, 6, 7. Exactly the same way you had for a basic encoder. The only difference is now because you have priority implemented, you are going to have uh, row expressions instead of direct inputs. And then there is also an additional output here which is idle which means I don't have anything on the input side. I did not get anything. So it is I0 or I1 or I2 and so on complemented which means I do not have any input active right now. That's the output called idle. So in terms of active high and active low everything is active high here. All eight inputs are active high. All three outputs are active low. All idle outputs, in this case only one, is also active low, uh, sorry, active high. So everything is active high. Uh, these are the outputs here and these are all the inputs here. There's a priority encoder. This is the eight, eight to three priority encoder. So we have added a new idea of idle, right? No active input. So that's to know whether the the chip got something or not, right? So if 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 you didn't get anything anything active on the input side, idle will be zero. So it is related to got something. So we can transition this conversation of the 8 to 3 priority encoder to an actual 74148 chip which is going to do the same thing but it has a, a few additional uh, inputs and outputs. Let's talk about those. First, we have active low inputs as well as outputs. Where are they? active low inputs here, active low outputs here. Then we have a enable input, active low enable input right here. So things will get encoded only when the enable input is active. Oh, sorry, this needs to also be included in this. Those are all active low inputs and outputs. Okay, in yellow. Uh, enable is active low. Only one. 
then we have an output called got something like we had idle earlier that's our got something active low so if it is zero that means you got something on the inputs by the way the inputs is their significance here this is the least significant input here is the most significant input here is the most significant output here is the least significant output next there is also a, an additional output called the enable output enable output is slightly different from all the others enable output essentially means do i have the a2 a1 a0 connected or are they uh, disconnected so are they just hanging so I, I will show you in a truth table in just a minute about how enable output works. Let us go up one bit and you can see this one. Let us go through this slowly. First, let's take a look at enable input, which is an active low input. So if it is inactive, no matter what the inputs are, all the outputs are going to be inactive. You did not get anything. Got something is inactive. And enable output is also inactive. Now, next case, you have the next eight cases. Enable input is active. Over here, i7 is active, i0, uh, 6 is active and so on. So that is encoded as um, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, and so on up to 1, 1, 1. 1, 1, 1 is when i0 is active. So when i0 is active, a2 and a1 and a0 should all be inactive. Inactive is 0, 1, 1, 1. Right. So I hope you can see that act, active low and active high, the, the difference there. But for all those eight cases, you got something, right? Because you got something here, 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 you got something here. And enable output underscore L is inactive. It becomes active when you have enable input is active. You have all the inputs that are not active. They are all one here. It cannot be decoded to anything. You didn't, so got something is not active. So you didn't get anything. So in that case, you have enable output as active. So it's essentially a, a, a complement of operation of got something only when enable is active, right? So it, it's, it's, they are the same only when enable is inactive. Now, that particular case, the use of this case is if you were to cascade priority encoders, those two outputs got something and enable output become very, very useful. That's, that's why that, that, is, that is used. All right, we have a few more minutes left. So I'm going to take a start in the conversation about tri-state buffers. Why tri-state? Well, the reason why we have we are talking about tri-states is because the output of this buffer, where is the buffer? Is right here. The triangle. The output of this buffer can be low, can be high. We have seen that. We have seen the output of the buffer being zero or one, but it can also be in the high impedance state. High impedance state essentially means it is a dangling wire, not connected to anything.
and this can be very useful when you want to tie multiple outputs together and we'll see an application of this in just a minute so here is the symbol of the tri-state buffer a is the input out is the output and you have an enable en input is active high output is active high enable is active high so let's see what happens if input is zero output will be zero when enable is one when a is one output will be one when enable is one so if it is enabled but if it is disabled zero no matter what the input is x the output will be in the high impedance state it will be disconnected so think of it as like a physical disconnection of the output wire when the enable is inactive pick those out here so that now you can see this uh, this is all of this is captured into a truth table here enable is low it doesn't matter any when enable is low it doesn't matter what the input is the output will be in the high impedance state but when it is enabled low goes to low high goes to high it's a buffer So that's the idea of a tri-state buffer and you know the application is tying multiple outputs together right when you tie multiple outputs together if one one output is zero the other output is one there could be a, a, a there is a confusion there so when you are trying to connect things multiple things to together then you would want that only one thing takes control so you'd want to disconnect everything else that's why the tri-state buffer uh, is very useful over here you have four different flavors of tri-state buffers being sketched what are the differences here the first one enable is active high input and output are active high over here enable is active low input and output are active high over here enable is active high input is active high output is active low which means input and output are complements of each other because of that bubble at the output next the last one is enable is active low input is active high output is active low now for the last one let us quickly sketch out its truth table here let's say i have enable because it's an active low enable i'm going to put underscore l uh, input is a active high output is active low so out underscore l so i can have a few combinations here i can have enable to be low low high high when it is low this could be low this could be high this could be low this could be high so when it is low and because it is enabled now it's active low low will become high here high will become low here inversion so you can think of this as a tri state inverter with active low enable this is a tri state inverter with active high enable these are buffers 
try state buffer, try state buffer. Try state buffer with active high enable and active low enable. Uh, okay, so when enable underscore L is a high, that means that it is actually inactive. The output in this case is going to be high impedance and high impedance, not connected. All right, so let us stop over here and let's pick up with tri-state buffers again when we meet.